Um, I will speak English, but um, if you have any problems with understanding them, so please ask. And um, also, well, any questions, any questions or discussions during this will be very welcome. I um, will be talking about dynamic semantics both today and tomorrow, and um, Professor Takogo asked me not to expect or presuppose any previous knowledge on this topic, at least not from everyone, so there may be some here who haven't seen much of that. Right. So we will do fairly basic things. Um, today we will be looking at some, some theories, frameworks in this dynamic uh, approach and see why people have put them together, what they do, how they work, and uh, perhaps their weaknesses. So, um, my main goal for you um, at the end of these two days is uh, that everyone here should be uh, completely um, confident or um, um, well, comfortable reading papers in this area. Often when uh, you read papers in dynamic semantics, the main obstacle is technicality, you don't really know how the formal system works and um, it's not well explained and so on. And so the goal here for this uh, is to um, just you know, get a, an intuitive feeling for that. We will um, look at some details very closely, but not at everything that is, can, can be said about all these theories. So we'll be very selective, only pick out the main um, well, ideas and properties and so on. And uh, if you have read the papers and there is something that I don't mention and you would like to talk about, please bring it up. I want to leave it to you as well about this goes. I'm not particularly um, you know, um, in, inflexible in this way. There's a handout, but so what? Right? We can always talk about other things. Due to a little accident, it was completely my own fault. The formatting of this handout is not the latest version, although the content is almost exactly what's on the latest version. Uh, so, but uh, on, there will be a nicer and somewhat edited version online in case you want to download it again. So this morning I just sent the, the home file, the home link. Okay. Alright, so dynamic semantics. Why is it useful and what um, has motivated it to begin with? I have here on this handout, three quotes by linguists, which uh, are from classics, classic uh, papers that have um, either preceded <coughs> the development of the dynamic semantics or were very early in the development of that framework. And they say very eloquently what the point is, what was lacking in the theories that people had used until then. Now, this starts here in the late 60s with Cartonen. Um, in those days, actually even Montague's semantics wasn't really developed yet. Uh, the, but um, there was already a close connection between linguistics and model theoretic semantics and philosophy. But uh, it was also clear and uh, becoming more and more obvious that that approach, although it's good for artificial languages, uh, misses some important properties of natural languages. And here are some, for, instance, for example, we don't have to read through all of these. But what Cartman says in this, um, in this quote is that if we read a text and go through it sentence by sentence, um, well, we do certain things, right? We have to remember what the what the text says, and uh, in order to keep track of the content of the text, we need to keep track of the individuals, the objects, events, things like that, which are mentioned and about which uh, assertions are made in the text. 
And that has not been easy in this uh, purely you know, first order um, logic approach because you know when the sentence is over, your variables are no longer bound and you cannot add anything else about something you have about the, an individual that you have mentioned earlier. So um, that is the main problem. Uh, so one of the main motivations for taking this dynamic turn was in order to extend, to open up the scope of the existential quantifier. That is a very important goal of this. Um, and then, it, by the way, this also extends to moral frameworks uh, which we'll discuss tomorrow where you have a similar problem Whitman would like to open up the scope of the possibility operator. Um, okay, so this is, this is important because in language we can refer back to things. But then, if you, look, if you looked at the paper, and then, well, even if you didn't look at the paper, um, he, he goes on to show that um, if there are lots of contexts which um, cut off these uh, discourse reference that we introduced from further uh, later than the forward reference. So we'll see a lot of examples of that later. That's why this is an interesting problem. Stonehenger, uh, this is a famous quote uh, from a, his paper called Assertion, in which he talks about the common ground and um, points out that a <laughs> sentence, the way it is interpreted when it is uttered in a situation, depends on that situation. That's very simple, although it was not easy to come up with that idea either because that means that the denotation of a sentence is not constant, it varies, there is a contextual parameter which determines what the sentence means, not only how it is interpreted, but actually its meaning depends on the context of the proposition that it denotes. And, um, and uh, there's the first part, and secondly, the sentence changes this context, so once it is processed or interpreted, the context is no longer what it was before. And so this is the dynamic aspect of um, you know, language from that perspective. And so the, the effect that sentences have on the context must somehow be accounted for, and that is another big um, important motivation for dynamic semantics. Uh, Kamp, finally, Hans Kamp, who um, invented discourse representation theory, which we'll see a little bit later, um, he had yet something else in mind, namely, um, not really something about uh, the common ground between two people who are talking to each other, but um, internal mental representations that um, are being built as we process language. So it's a little bit like this Cartonian idea, although Cartonian had a, the metaphor of a computer that reads and needs to keep track of things. Um, Kamp says when we understand, read, or hear a um, well, some linguistic output, and we do that too. So we build stepwise representations that grow more and more rich as we get new information and um, so his goal was to build a formal language that mirrors that process which also consists of expressions that can be um, successfully um, enriched indefinitely because you don't know when your discourse is over you always have to be ready to put in more new information yeah, okay, so those are really uh, some of the main ideas, some of those <coughs> classics. And what's next here on this handout are some more specific observations which um, you know have linguistic examples and so on and show you that it's not it's not easy to actually know what exactly, you know, if you want to extend the scope of the existential quantifier, for instance, it's not easy to know uh, how far and uh, in what contexts you are supposed to do that. Um, so 
Traditionally, indefinite noun phrases like a boy were interpreted uh, with existential quantifiers, and that's where it came from, Frigg and so on. Um, and um, in a sentence like one, for instance, uh, you know, a very straightforward representation of that is the formula on the right. There is an x, plus an x to boy, and there is a y, which is a girl, and x and y, something like that. Right? And um, so in number two, the problem there is if you have something like she smiled, the next sentence, then in English that is interpreted as being about the girl whom the boy met, right? But there's no way to put that assertion, why smiled, into the scope of the operator, the quantifier that binds that variable, why. If you assume that sentences are processed one by one, then you cannot do that, you don't get it in there anymore. Um, and so the why in the second, in 2b, is um, not bound, it doesn't co-vary with the boy, uh, the girl in the previous sentence. Okay, secondly, all of matters, this uh, shows that indefinites actually change the context in introducing new things to refer to, that is, uh, what it says here, all of matters in number three, a man walks in the park, and I have these little numbers uh, there that just means that the next, you know, the E, which has the same number, is co-referring back to the man. So a man walks in the park, he whistles, perfectly fine, just uh, like two, same sort of example, but in 3b um, you can not uh, assert sentences in that order, at least not with the intended meaning in which he refers to the man. He whistles, a man walks in the park, it's of course well formed, but not on that reading, so he here has to refer to some other person, some, some other um, reference that has been introduced earlier. Okay, so yeah, so the, the scope of indefinite extends to the right but not to the left. That is basically the, the lesson. So it closely mirrors the way we process input, linguistic input, stepwise, right, one by one. So, uh, okay, uh, each sentence changes the context in which subsequent sentences are interpreted but not this good. that doesn't extend to the left. Um, doesn't affect earlier ones. Okay. Yeah. What happened if we say when he's when he was whispering a man I don't know if uh, this sentence is okay or not, but uh, obviously we do have sentences like um, yeah. when a man she is walking, she was walking, a man was hit by Yes, there is, with adjunct clauses, so, so in certain contexts you can do that. Mm -hmm. um, um, usually, whatever, usually when he is on vacation, John goes to bed early or something, or whatever, you know. so he comes before John. And all I can say about that is that uh, this is usually considered a syntactic problem. Um, okay. And uh, so, I mean, I, I guess the best account of this is due to Kirchhoff. Mm -hmm. But this um, idea here is that uh, the information has uh, some kind of direction. Yes, yes. But if you look at the way Kirchhoff handles those sentences that you mentioned, he actually says you have a kind of you know, um, silent reshuffling in the logical form, so that those things actually do come after the indefinite. So it's a little bit of a trick. It doesn't really, I mean, it's not, you know, it doesn't really solve the problem, because it's kind of, I think, stipulated. So no one has a good idea of how to incorporate those. I guess, I mean, it's clear intuitively what happens. Usually when he's on vacation, we are somehow able to, to um, set up this discourse referent, even though we know that some information is still missing, so there has to be some kind of temporary process whereby we can you know, um, keep that, um, well, sort of pending until we get the subject. 
So that's what, that's what I would tell as a semantic story about this, but I haven't worked on that myself. So I'm not aware of any good solution to it. So when we talk about these indefinite, uh, one thing I want to make clear is that we're not talking about specific readings, even though um, they can have specific readings in number two, for instance. Uh, so a sentence like, Bill didn't see a misprint in English can mean two things, either that there is a misprint that Bill didn't see, or, well, he didn't see any misprint, right? Um, I hope. And uh, the first one, 4a, is specific in that um, the speaker has some sort of you know, particular misprint in mind of which he's saying that Bill didn't see that one. Whereas 4b, this, you know, for one thing, does not entail that there are misprints and uh, also does not imply that the speaker has some particular thing in mind. Um, so, um, and you can see this with the anaphoric reference uh, possibilities in 5 in A, you can easily refer to that misprint later on. Uh, this one here, you know, misprint which Bill didn't see, is on page 10, but in 5 B, you cannot refer to the misprint on that reading. He saw no misprint, he's on page 10. Um, and I mean, this is a slightly different sentence, but if you think of 4, um, on this reading, then you see that there are two, you cannot refer back to the misprint. So sometimes later sentences disambiguate, disambiguate earlier sentences. Uh, if you hear it is on page 10, you know that it must have been specific. But the point here is that usually when people explore the behavior of indefinites and dynamic semantics, they're not interested in this kind of reading, specific reading, because that is kind of boring, it's always, uh, you know, always makes discourse reference available for future reference. What's more interesting is 5b, where, um, well, it's a paraphrase of 4, right, uh, so if you had 4 on that reading, you didn't see a misprint, there you have an indefinite, and you cannot refer back to the misprint that was introduced. That's the point. So um, there are constraints on this. Okay, so am I too slow? Tell me. I'm a little slow, I think. Yeah? Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let me know. Um, uh, all right, so conditionals are another um, very prominent example of this sort of thing. Uh, the interesting thing here is uh, in con within conditionals, so an if-then sentence, like if, if a farmer owns a donkey, he beats it. Um, so there are two indefinites, a farmer and a donkey, and both of those indefinites uh, refer to individuals that can also be picked up later. Uh, so one problem is, or, or one puzzle is why that is possible. We'll see in a minute why that is. Another puzzle is why that doesn't work beyond the conditional sentence itself. So if you look at possible ways in which you might try to translate 6 into some sort of first order formula using existential quantifiers to represent the indefinites, you see that there is really no way to get this right. I mean, it's, it's probably not an exhaustive list of all the possibilities, but it's either, the problem is either that B, uh, sorry, that X and Y in the second, in the consequent, he beats it, are not bound by those quantifiers, or it is that you get the, the wrong truth conditions. For example, in 6C, um, you know, if you force it and try to extend the scope of these indefinites beyond conditional connective. Uh, you can see that this sentence is true as well, for example, um, as long as there is something that is not a farmer that makes the sentence true. So <coughs> things like that are certainly not, uh, no actually wait, uh, that is, there has to be, sorry, as long as there is no farmer that makes it true. I mean, yeah. 
Um, that is not um, an intuitively correct reading of the sentence, so it has to be taken care of. And the right, the intuitively right uh, translation is what you get with universal quantifiers, as in 16, for all x and y, if x is a farmer, y is a donkey, and x owns y, then x beats y, and here these universals have wide scope, and it works out fine. But, um, you know, to, um, to turn this into a linguistic theory, you need to say when and why indefinite noun phrases sometimes refer to universal, or denote universal quantifiers, and sometimes existentials. And um, that becomes very difficult. Um, okay, so, yeah, that is one, one problem. And uh, the other, so, so you know, the, the in, inside conditionals, you can refer back to these things uh, um, that were buried inside one of the constituents from the other constituent. The other thing is in seven, um, that you cannot do the same thing once the conditional is over. You can say in 7a, if a farmer owns a donkey, he beats it because he doesn't like its attitude. That is okay. But uh, you cannot say, if a farmer owns a donkey, he beats it, he doesn't like its attitude. But, now, do you have the same intuitions about this, or are you, do you need um, convincing to buy these judgments? I'm not sure, I mean, it's a little, a little different in Japanese, perhaps, because you don't always have to mention those things. And I'm not sure. Let me know if you find the judgments uh, wrong or unintuitive. So. Well, even in English, depending on what kind of sentences you have, well, some people feel that uh, uh, they, they, can, uh, they can use a pronoun in a second sentence with this uh, uh, syntactic structure. The first one is generic, and then it's kind of a generic sentence. If, if, if you have a yeah. generic sentence, then um, Yes. You can use the pronoun in the second sentence, right? Right. If, uh, yes, we'll see, it. we'll see something like that in a minute. Um, so her point is that the first is interpreted as a generic about farmers in general. And the second one is also interpreted as generic. That is actually possible. The same happens if, they, are both, if they both have certain models that are compatible with each other. We'll see some examples of that. Yeah, there's another one of the little uh, complications. Uh, actually, uh, let's look at page four, down, in, down there, suppositions and modality. So this is not about generics, but uh, you know, consider 14a, uh, for, for, let's say 14b, let's consider 14b. If Mary has a car, she will take me to work in it. I can drive the car too. That is judged okay by most speakers, even though I just said that some, such a thing is impossible with conditionals. Um, if Mary had a car, she would take me to work. I could drive the car too. If Mary, uh, and um, protein B as well, if Mary has a car, she will take me to work in it. I was that already said that, right? I can drive it too. Uh, you see that in all of these cases, the model in the second sentence can, could, right, those auxiliaries, somehow, in, in some vague sense, agrees with the model in the first sentence. It somehow depends on that. Because if you, if you think about what the second sentence means in something like 14b, um, it still doesn't mean that there is a car that you can drive, right? It also is a conditional semantically. It still has the same conditional antecedents. If Mary has a car, I can drive it. That's basically what that sentence means. Um, so that's modal subordination that we'll talk about tomorrow. Um, and in those cases, you can put additional you know, uh, refer back into in the uh, context uh, even beyond the scope of uh, conditional. That's one of the things that make this phenomenon extremely tricky and messy, as you can imagine, because 
once you look at this domain with models and generics and so on, um, judgments often become blurry and uh, gradient and you know, less clear. Uh, negation, though, is well. The negation also has uh, similar problems. Actually, uh, now at the top of page four, there are sentences in eight A and in eight and nine. In eight, you have a non-negated sentence: "Bill has a car." And all of the three sentences in B, C, and D are uh, good continuations of A. Right? All of them can be used. You know, with the intended reference being that car that Bill has, Bill's car. And none of this works in 9. Bill doesn't have a car. It is black. Um, it's again bad, although, again, um, on a specific reading, there is a car that Bill doesn't have. It's, it's fine, but we're not looking at that reading, so we have to somehow try to get that out of our minds while we look at these examples. Um, otherwise, 9, B, C, D are all bad. Okay, um, Cartan has this example, and he also points out that um, the problem with 9A is not that it doesn't entail the existence of the car. It doesn't matter whether the car exists or not. You know, the same thing happens with unicorns, which we all assume don't exist. Uh, Bill didn't see a unicorn. The unicorn had a gold mane is also bad. So this does not have to do with the existence of a referent. It is a linguistic problem. The negation blocks this anaphoric reference. Um, and uh, I say here usually, negation usually does this because it doesn't always do this. And now we are again in the, in the messy area of modal subordination. 12, you see, Bill doesn't have a car. It is parked outside is bad. It would be parked outside is okay. Again, interpreted semantically as something like a conditional sentence. If he had a car, it would be parked outside. So 12C can be said, for instance, uh, if you try to tell me why you think that Bill doesn't have a car, right? If he had one, it would be parked outside. There is no car outside, therefore. Doesn't have one. Um, so these models they can reach into negation in some sense, and this is similar to the modal subordination cases. Dynamic semantic theories has have a special way of dealing with this sort of thing, and we'll get there um, in due course, uh, mostly tomorrow though. But uh, what I have here at the bottom of page four, this uh, little quote under fourteen, which is from Cartman's paper. That pretty much sums up the main intuition that researchers have when they look at moral subordination. All of the above examples elaborate a hypothetical, sorry, hypothetical situation that is based on the counterfactual or dubious premise that Mary has a car. So you introduce this uh, hypothetical state of affairs and then uh, you can still refer to it uh, later on. But the context sentences from which you refer back into the, the original hypothetical state also have to be hypothetical. Right? They cannot be just indicative um, declarative sentences. That's why you have modals in both cases. Or when you have negation, it has to be a counterfactual constituent. It would be parked part outside. Not it will be parked outside or anything like that. Right? How about the the pop up at the stop or in the shop, the educational bathroom, or it is in a strange place? Yes, I didn't put that on here. Yeah, but there's that's another example. Um, yeah, this is this is even harder. Yeah? And in DRT people have wondered about it a lot. Uh, so what she said is there's another example of this sort of thing where um, the sentence says either there is no bathroom in this house or it is in a strange place, a peculiar place. Okay. Um, 
So you have a disjunction here, and in the first disjunct, um, well, what is said is to speak of the possibility of there being no bathroom. But in the second conjunct, disjunct, you can refer to that bathroom that doesn't exist, or something like that. Uh, I don't really want to go there. We can, we can talk about that tomorrow, with, uh, because this shows up in DRT treatments uh, quite a bit. Um, but I actually don't know the solution to these sentences. Um, in, uh, in DRT, so I'm talking, sorry, DRT, discourse representation theory, one of these um, theories that we'll be dealing with, people have tried to address this with some stipulation um, whereby I just do this in disjunctions. Um, in the following sense, you have um, right. you have something like uh, either A or B um, and especially with this, you indicate that your disjunction is exclusive, in which case uh, this is actually becoming something like either A or not A and B. This is sort of uh, silent, tacit, right? Or there is a bathroom and it is in a strange place. Uh, so this is the intuition. The problem is that A is negated in this case, right? No bathroom. There is no bathroom. Or, it's not the case that there is no bathroom and it's our place of place, P, okay, place, strange place, whatever. Um, now the problem is, of course, we have two negations here and it's not clear why, why two negations should make the referent available that is blocked by one negation. And this is the stipulation that people just make that two negations can be, uh, well, taken away. They can just be collapsed into nothing, all right? And then, of course, it, it's okay, because then you end up with either there is no bathroom or there is a bathroom and it's in a strange place. And then the point is that you actually are not referring into this disjunct, but into the tacit, quiet, silent, uh, you know, assumption that you make here. So that's all I can say about those sentences. I'm not happy with this approach, but I don't know the better one either. I guess when you want to, you could, well, we, could, we can think about that. You can imagine with some sort of focus structure approach with that alternative things. But, yeah. Isn't it like in the bathroom example, you you talk about one bathroom always, right? Like there is a bathroom that is not here uh -huh. or is somewhere else. But in the Bill doesn't have a car, there is a car that Bill doesn't have. But there is probably a billion cars that he doesn't have. So yes. you yeah. say that if you refer to, to the car if later, you don't know to which you refer. Yes, that's, that's interesting. That's right. Um, but that is a property of these specific readings in general. So, um, and yeah, of course, logically, it's a little puzzling that you can do this, even though it's clear that there are many cars, and you have not used any sort of, you, know, you have not put in so much descriptive content that there is exactly one car that satisfies the, the, the property. Still, the listener will not object on the grounds that there are many cars. Uh, so in the, in the subsequent sentence, you can refer it to uh, as the car with a definite. Uh, so that means that somehow you have managed to set up um, a unique object or discourse referent as the car that you're talking about. Uh, and indefinites can do that. and. It's interesting to think about how one can model this. Uh, 
perhaps if there is time tomorrow, we can talk about this as currently. And I don't actually plan to talk about this, but um, uh, if you have a richer representation of the context that includes people's beliefs or people's knowledge about the discourse, then you can encode a situation in which the speaker knows which car he is referring to. The listener doesn't know that, but the listener knows that the speaker has a particular car in mind. And the speaker knows that the listener knows that there is a particular car. And so they can just pretend that this particular car is given for now. And the listener doesn't care because the identity of the car doesn't matter. That's sort of um, in a nutshell. I think this was a little past, perhaps. I'm not sure. But this is how um, this can actually be formalized. There are papers on this topic by people like Van Roy or also Roger Schwarzschild has written something on that. Uh, well, there's time tomorrow. Maybe, yeah, we'll see. It'll be interesting. But you see, roughly what the idea is that you if you have this mutual knowledge about the other person's intentions, then even though you don't know which car it is, it's enough to know that there is one that the speaker has in mind. It doesn't matter which one. Yeah. All right, uh, okay, so, and what did I just say here? Okay, 14. Uh, 15 shows that this sort of thing also happens with models. Thief might come in, he would still steal the silver. Although you cannot say a thief might come in, he is tall, unless you have a specific thief in mind again. Right. Same thing. And then there are some other um, cases in 16 which show that it really matters what mood or you know, what sort of formal uh, model form you could have in the second clause. If Mary has a car, she will take me to work on it, in it. Uh, you can only say it will be a Mustang. But in the counterfactual sentence, if she had a car, she would take me to work in it. It has to be, it would be a Mustang. So there has to be some sort of agreement between these two models. But it turns out a little hard to describe this. So this is a there, there are still things being discovered in this area. And, uh, it's not, not yet completely um, clear. And finally, you have attitude verbs like want and so on. Mary wants to marry a rich man. He is a banker. That's good. But it has to be specific. It can only be a specific reading. It cannot be something like Mary wants to marry some rich man or other. And on that reading, you cannot continue with he is a banker. You can continue as in B with he must be a banker. That works on a non specific reading. So it's again one of those uh, moral subordination cases. And if you are familiar with this uh, classification of morals, the ontic morals about obligation, um, this that is actually on the, the only reading on which 17b works. If it's something like it, for all I know, it has to be a banker. This must. Uh, then again, it has. This is, it can only be specific. So actually, it matters which which uh, reading of must you have in the second sentence. Um, yeah. Well, okay. So in the last one in eighteen, these are called hop knob sentences because I mean, those names only appear here. But philosophical literature, they were introduced with funny names. John believes that a squirrel ate his breakfast, and Mary believes that it ruined the flower bed. Uh, we have two people here, two dis distinct agents, the leaf states, John and Mary. Um, and it's actually not required that Mary thinks of the same squirrel that it ruined the flower bed. It, you know, it, Mary does not have to think, in order for this to be true, she does not have to think, uh, the squirrel that John believes ate his breakfast ruined the flower bed. That is not required. 
she may not even know that John believes of some squirrel that it rules part of it. Still, these can co-refer in a certain special sense, and the problem there is that this happens across different belief states, so it's it's very tricky. Bill hopes that Tornado will destroy the school building, and Freddy hopes it will level the police station too. Yeah, okay. Alright, so this is our little survey on some data that motivates what we are doing here. And now we can skip the next section if you're all familiar with standard static, non-dynamic, formal semantics, whole theory. Perhaps we can quickly go through it. Well, who is who would like to go a little bit uh, through these, uh, you know, what is the syntax and semantics of first-order predicate logic? Should we do that? Yes. Pick page six does that in a very quick way. So the purpose of this is um, to just set the stage because in these dynamic interpretations uh, we have the same kinds of definitions. And so we need to um, be able to uh, yeah, just tell immediately what is going on there. Okay, so you have a language L, which is built um, out of a number of things. So you have, uh, first of all, is it um, starts, uh, in language is number one, starts with a set of variables V, okay? Individual variables, which uh, are these things like x and y and so on, right? x, y, and whatever. Um, C, a set of individual constants like John, Mary, and so on, but also con predicate constants like C, uh, smokes, um, and meats, and so on. So these are all the non-logical constants of our language. And so these individual variables, and we don't have variables over things like spoke and mean, so. Um, and out of these, we uh, you know, we take the union of these two to then say we have a set of terms, as what it is called here in my handout. Terms. Those are oh, sorry. I should be careful. Um, I don't think you have that section or not. Huh? You don't have this. Page six. But I no, this can't be. <laughs> Oh my god, so what, I wonder now what, from when <laughs> your handout was, that probably, I thought it was almost the most beautiful. Well, should we, I suggest that we just continue and maybe make new copies in the break. Is that okay? Lunch break. Or do you want to take a break in between? I haven't actually asked you about that. You want to go through two hours in one um, session? If, it's okay with me. If possible, I would like to change the tape. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we can take a little break and uh, perhaps print the right or copy this version of the handout. Yeah. Um, perhaps then I shouldn't go through this because you'll, you'll have to soon. Let's not go through this now. Because uh, we, can, we can, so the next section is on Heim, right? Heim 83B or something, right? Well, which is a simple and very readable paper um, which introduces some of the basic ideas of this presupposition, uh, sorry, the dynamic semantics uh, Kant. It's about presupposition as the title says, it's a, you know, the uh, title is 
on the projection problem of presuppositions, something like that. And uh, even though this is not about presuppositions, this this session here, uh, let me just briefly say why or you know, what kinds of examples she wants to account for there. So maybe now the, the example numbers are also off. Is it 20 the first example there? Sorry. We can have a out there. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, it's 19. So, um, the possessive, as it occurs here with John's daughter, that sort of thing, um, presupposes the existence of the individual that is to. So, cannot make some assertion about John's daughter out of the blue unless it is somehow known or at least easy to accommodate that he has a daughter. Right. Um, so, this squiggly arrow here is, uh, is supposed to express that relation. Um, so, John's daughter is bald. Uh, presupposes that John has a daughter and John has a daughter and his daughter is bald doesn't presuppose that John has a daughter. Are you familiar with it? Is that okay to, to go through it at this pace if you want to talk more about this? It's a little tricky. Um, John's daughter is bald and he has a daughter even though that is simply switching the order of the conjunction in B is no longer good for two reasons. One is that the first conjunct again uh, sort of presupposes, it creates this presupposition that he has a daughter and for the second reason is that the second conjunct is redundant after the first one has been processed. Right? Um, and the whole sentence presupposes that he had a daughter. So then, indeed, if John has a daughter, his daughter is bald. There is a similar effect there. Um, doesn't presuppose that he had a daughter. But if John has a son, his daughter is bald. Presupposes that he has a daughter. Actually, there is some debate. Um, it's probably more. It's probably more correct to say that it presupposes that. If John has a son, he has a daughter, but uh, that's not the quarrel of that. In any case, there is a presupposition about the daughter. It's not there in E. Uh, and well, likewise uh, in G, that we have already seen, John doesn't have a daughter. She is bald. Doesn't work as, as before. So we have this asymmetry here with these conjunctions and the conditional. These examples, um, B, C, B versus C, and um, D versus E, where uh, the order matters, and somehow the content of these sentences matters too, right? Whether the presupposition is there or not cannot be determined simply by looking at the connective, the, the logical structure of these sentences. It actually matters what they say, what they mean. Because otherwise, it couldn't expl explain why D and E are so different. Okay. Alright, so yeah, um, the order matters and the content matters as well. <coughs> These are some of the motivating examples, not all of them. But uh, let's, let's look at first, first at how she, how she accounts for this behavior. Um, there are some assumptions here in section 2.2. First of all, sentences are interpreted in this left to right fashion, one by one. Um, so there are pieces of these sentences, sort of atomic little um, uh, expressions, formulas, which uh, each of them individually is processed one after the other, and the previous one affects the content, and you know the next one affects the sorry context. The next one affects the context for the subsequent one, and so on. And um, 
So she actually calls these meanings of sentences context, change, potentials, no longer propositions or anything like that. For her, in this paper, the main goal of semantic theory is not to determine the truth conditions of a sentence, but to determine what it does to you if you hear it or if you accept it. Okay. Uh, so the context includes some knowledge and the sentence may affect that knowledge, it adds to it, it changes things. Uh, and um, the goal is to dis determine how exactly that happens. And so these context change potentials, formally, they are functions from contexts to contexts. So you have an input context, then you, you run the sentence at like a program, uh, some procedure, and then you get an output context in a different state. Right? And it's a partial function in this account because this is how she accounts, how she um, you know, incorporates the presupposition problem. So if the presupposition is not satisfied in the input context, then the result of interpreting the sentence is undefined. You don't get an output. Okay. Uh, which is pretty good, because this is what it feels like. Right? If the presupposition is not there, we don't know what to make of the sentence. So that. Okay. Now we are on page 7 of this handout, at least. Um, okay, there's, so she has two, two systems. One of them is simpler than the other. One is just propositional logic. There are no individuals involved, uh, only facts, uh, propositions. And we should look at that first. That is uh, in the middle of page 7 what um, she discusses there. So the context, she takes that notion directly from Stallnaker and that paper where we saw a uh, quote on the first page. Context is just, you know, something like a set of worlds, W, B, and whatever, you know. Now, um, she asks you to imagine this as representing someone's knowledge or beliefs. In fact, not a particular speaker's beliefs, but um, all the propositions that be between the two people who are interacting, who are speaking, the speaker and the hearer, between them have been accepted as given for the purposes of this particular conversation. So they may, dis dis they may disagree on some things, but ignore that. And there are some, some facts which they agree are true. And that's what they presuppose. And then, uh, you know, those things may come from um, general world knowledge that you can assume I have as well, or from the previous discourse from what had already been inserted. Okay, now uh, uh, let's just think of this as a set of worlds. They all differ in some respects, but they all have in common that they are consistent, compatible with those. Um, presuppositions that have been um, have been uh, uh, attached to the sentence. Okay, and now there is this operator plus, which says that you know, give this context, you process a sentence A. This is I'm following the notation in that paper. She uses these letters for uh, sentences. And what you get is a context in which A is accepted or um, known or believed, um, something like that. So, you know, if the A, if the A worlds are these and we have the non A worlds here, then we are left with um, this part, right? Cut away the other. Sorry, I'm not very good at drawing these things. And this is here, this is the context C plus A. Um, and now for the other connectives of propositional logic, we get similar clauses now in terms of this uh, basic operation. Uh, now, uh, for example, if you want to update with the negation of A, 
This is now defined in terms of this update. Uh, so what you want to end up with is a context in which it is known that A is false, so where all the A worlds have been removed, discarded, right? Uh, and those worlds that are discarded are that happen to be just this set that you get from updating with A. And so this is defined as C. Uh, I have this backslash here, which is set subtraction. Sometimes you see a minus there. I'm not sure what you prefer, but um, this is what it does, right? Um, it's interesting, and this is very important, this will be important tomorrow, um, to realize that in the process of running this procedure, you actually construct this thing, this context. Even though you throw it away, uh, it is present for some moment. Uh, this has, and you can see that this, this can be exploited if you want to account for model subordination. If you somehow want to refer into something about so the scope of negation. Uh, well, we'll talk about that later, but uh, the next one is um, conjunction, which simply is, you know, executing one after the other, A and B, C plus A plus B, or something like this, right? Um, so just sequential execution of the procedure right, for each of these conjuncts. Um, okay, and finally we have the arrow. Uh, if A and B, now this looks a little more tricky. Uh, so let me write it down first. C minus C plus A minus C plus a plus B, I may not get all the parentheses right, but it does not worry about that so much. Um, something like this. On the next page, this is a mouthful, right? It's a little hard to see why it should be like this. On the next page, at the top of page 8, there is actually a, um, a little stepwise explanation why this is the right expression. So if you, if you start out with A and B being both uh, Logically independent, you have four cells in a partition, and these are all your different worlds in the context as far as A and B identify them. And now, if you see what happens first, uh, you update um, with A. Uh, we'll see later that this is exactly what you do because you know, in order to subtract something here from C, you need to first know what this is, but you also need to subtract something from this. The first let's build the C plus A. Those are um, the worlds in which A is true, so only the upper ones, right? The, other, the others have to be discarded. Uh, let me write it in here AB and A not B. Uh, this upper, this overline is okay, I use it for negation sometimes. And there's no space, I hope. You don't mind. So this is, if this is C, then this is C plus A. Um, and now we have to subtract from this C plus A plus B. We first need to know what that is, so we update this thing with B and end up with only the AB worlds. Right. And now we have all the ingredients that we need to cu calculate what this is. Um, from, a, from C plus A, we need to subtract C plus A plus B. So from this, we subtract this. So we end up with the other 